I know it's becoming kind of a cliche, but here I am recording again on a Tuesday morning, and what in the world is this week going to bring? Um, all the so-called prophetic voices, all of those people that have these, well, I talk to someone in the know, and my secret sources, and, you know, if you, if you stop and think about it, uh, all these people that say that they have, you know, I could tell you that my sources say that it's a good idea right now to have a couple of weeks of, uh, of food and water and supplies stored up in your house. And that would sound really, really amazing. But the problem is, is just a good friend of mine who's in law enforcement. I won't even tell you where, but uh, I, could, I could make it sound a lot better than it actually is, right? And so what is this week going to bring? <sighs> yeah, your guess right now is as good as mine. We'll walk it out together, but there is a uh, there is a, a, a great um, how how should I say this? There's a word that's in this Torah portion that should give us great comfort. There you go. It's not a real difficult word. I just couldn't think of it off the top of my head. But the word is actually the title of this week's Torah portion, and it's the word bow. Now, if you look in most uh, most scriptures, you will see that that word bow is translated go, but it is actually not, that's, that's the exact opposite, absolutely, it is the exact opposite of what the word means. It does not mean to go, it means come. And so it's, it's uh, if we look at the word, and we're going to probably get to this a little bit more, but the word bow is a bait a vav and a uh, and an olive. So the bait is the house. The vav is the uh, is a connector, and the olive is a letter of the ox or the letter of strength. So it's literally saying, I, what I want you to do here, Moshe, is I want you to connect with the strength of my house as you enter into the Pharaoh's house. Okay, now that's that gives us a little bit of a word picture there. And, and on a sideline, uh, though I don't follow these things, I was listening to the radio the other day, and I guess that the, uh, the Chinese, you know, the Chinese New Year, every year is a different animal. And, I, you know, one's a monkey and whatever. I, I have no idea how they possibly got this. But um, I won't even speculate. But I was—I heard the other day that this is the year of the ox, which is the aleph of the Hebrew language, the aleph bet, uh, the year of strength, uh, his strength. Okay, well, I guess we'll just have to ride this one out and see if there's any correlation right there. So Moshe is, is told by, it says, Yah said to Moshe, Come to Pharaoh, for I have made him and his servants hard-hearted, so I can demonstrate these signs of mine among them. What is he saying? Now, my wife has, uh, in, in, uh, in her prayer, a lot of times she will say something like, um, what's, I, I don't remember the exact quote, but you're already there. You know, kind of a, and I think that's more, maybe more of an assurance to Kathy than it is anything else. Because if we understand that the Almighty is already where we're going, then we're not going there alone, are we? And that's the essence of what this is. When Moshe is told, you need to come. You need to come to where Pharaoh is. He's already, he's also saying, when you get to Pharaoh, you're going to find that there's a presence there that I'm already there in the midst of it. See, I mean, I know that we, is, is that, again, that cliche I talked about a few weeks ago, we've read the back of the book, and we know who wins, all right? Well, that's, that's a great thing to say, but do we really have a comprehension of that statement? The answer is probably not. But it still makes a very good cliche. With Moshe, he could say, you know, I've read this chapter of what happens with Pharaoh, and I know that I'm going to win, but i got to walk it out anyway. It's the walking it out 
that we have occasionally a little difficulty in regarding our faith. And then you have all this stuff that's happening around it, okay? I mean, how, how many of us saw this, this happening a year ago, okay? Uh, how many of us saw? Was, I, I, I looked this morning on the, on the web, and the last, and I'm not getting trying to get political at all this, but uh, what I saw this morning was that part of the uh, Biden administration, if that's what the truth will be on, on Monday or on Wednesday afternoon, uh, part of the Biden administration, he's now put a, uh, a transgender man who thinks he's a woman from Pennsylvania in charge of, he's going to be part of the health secretary or something. Really? I, I mean, does, does that to anyone make any kind of sense? And, and I walk out, I, I know this is off topic, but I walk out this, this kind of on a, sometimes a moment by moment basis, right in between being anger, you know, being angry over what I see in happening and grieving over what I see happening. And that's, I mean, that's literally kind of a, you know, you go back and forth and anyone that, that can watch the news today and not be angry in, at, some, at some level, um, I, I don't know what to say to you. I, I'm not there. And anyone that can look at the news and, and not grieve over some of it, and there had to be this, this, the same thing that's happening in Egypt. Yeah, the Hebrews are there. They've forgotten who they are. They've forgotten their identity. They forgot about the, you know, the, the times, and they've forgotten about what they were told that Abraham was promised. And, you know, here they are as slaves, and the plagues are coming. The plagues are upon them. What's their emotions that are going back and forth? Folks, they were human, the same as we are today. And so we're going to have to walk through some, and I don't, I mean, saying this, I don't like to say that we're going to have to walk through some of the emotions of this. And maybe um, Kathy will probably have a little conversation with me about what I'm about to say later on when she, when she listens Sometimes we're going to need to give each other a little break as we walk through and work through some of those emotions because they are there. But as we walk through them, understand where we're going. Don't get your eyes off of the destination that we are called to. That's, I mean, for me, that's really the only thing that kind of keeps me sane on a daily basis is that, I do have, I, I personally believe that I have a, a pretty good grasp on the prayer, your kingdom come. I've got a pretty good grasp on the possibility that this thing is heading in the right direction. And I understand it. <coughs> I understand this. No matter where it's heading, the Father is walking before us. Yah is walking before us as we go through it on a daily basis. I hope that gives you, maybe I rambled there for a few moments, but that's really not unusual. Um, maybe that'll give you a little bit of comfort also. Well, when Moshe comes in before the Pharaoh, and once again, you know, let my people go. Now, notice that he is already, it says that he is hard-hearted. That Pharaoh has, all, has hardened his heart to the place that it cannot be changed. There is, there is no repentance, there, there's no avenue for repentance in this man. And th this is an argument that has been for centuries of, you know, does, does the Almighty harden someone's heart to the place that they can't repent? Well, this is what the verse is saying, but we, uh, we understand that only by going back and seeing that Pharaoh himself hardened his heart. He had been given the opportunities along the way for repentance. But there comes a point, and this, is a, this should be a, a scary thought for us. There comes a point in a person's life 
that they say no so many times. And I don't know what that number is. I, I don't know where that line is drawn. That's not up to me or you to figure out. But there comes a point that the hardness of their heart is something that cannot be undone. It cannot be changed. We look, and I was uh, just talking uh, briefly with, with Barry Phillips a, a moment ago. He said on his 10-minute Torah, he said for this coming out uh, tomorrow, which is probably yesterday for some of you or the day before. It was Wednesday for him. It would be coming out. It's crazy when we record stuff and then the, the scheduling of it. But he said, you know, the people that you're watching on the, the media and the politicians, there, there's, a demonic, uh, there's a demonic anger toward not just Trump, but toward you and toward me. The only way to describe what is happening today is demonic anger that's coming forth. And that anger is because of the anger and rage that, the, that Hasatan has toward the Creator Himself. And so what, we're do, what we are living out today is we're entering into a time in which the spiritual realm rage that has been from the fall of Hasatan, Satan, that, that spiritual realm rage has now entered into this physical realm. When you watch people, it, it makes no sense. Why should someone hate someone? Anybody that doesn't have a, an idea of Scripture or what is happening in a spiritual realm, how can they possibly understand this? They can't. They can't. They have to understand spiritual principles before they can understand what is happening in the natural. So there's this, but with that is a false repentance or a, uh, again, a false repentance, but it's also is, is tied in with a compromise. And, and so all of these things that we see happening, again, go to, you know, Corinthians, prefigurative historical events, all of these things that we see happening to Moshe and the Hebrews either are happening to us today or will happen to us in the future at some point. There will be from uh, political and religious system leaders, there will be false repentance. Now, how that's going to play out, I, I, I don't know. I could, I could give some guesses on it, but I'll just kind of let it go for now and we'll see how it happens and just if you if you know what to prepare for, then when it actually happens, then you can adjust. But you you have an idea that this is what's going to happen. If you if you've ever done any kind of firearms training, okay, uh, clearing rooms and things, I've done some, not much, but uh, a little bit. <clears throat> and you you know you you go through that door. Well, you don't really know what's on the other side of that door, but you have an idea that there's a bad guy, that there's some kind of target, some kind of paper target of a bad guy, and so you don't know which corner of the room, you don't know what he's going to look like, but you do have an idea when you open that door that something's going to be there, and that at least prepares you for it. You're, you're at the ready when you walk through the door. The same thing of this, of knowing that there's going to be from religion, from political, there's going to be some type of compromise, false repentance that's going to be through that door. So we begin to kind of set our, our um, uh, discernment antenna toward that a little bit so that we see it as it's happening in front of us. Um, for this it's well you know you guys how about the men go out in the wilderness and worship but you need to leave the as my granddad would say the women folk and and the kids behind leave all your possessions here in egypt basically this way i know you're coming back because if i let all of you go out there i think i've probably lost the battle well moshe had get this, 
Moshe had an opportunity to compromise with Pharaoh. He could have looked good in everybody's eyes at that moment. Think about it. He goes back. I mean, Moses, Moshe is it's not that just Pharaoh hates him, but the very people that he's trying to deliver don't really like the guy. Uh, there's a lesson in that one, by the way. <clears throat> and so what if he could have gone back to the Hebrews and said, hey, guys, you know, we've had a little rough time here in, in uh, Egypt, but I've decided, you know, Pharaoh gave me a, an opportunity to, to compromise a little bit, and so I decided to take it just to give him, get him off of our back for a while. They'd have all been making, I mean, th they would have had the, the new Moses statue right there in the middle of Goshen, right? Well, Moses wasn't concerned about looking good in the eyes of the Hebrews. He wasn't concerned about looking good in the eyes of Pharaoh. He only had one. He only had one entity in mind that he wanted to look good in front of, and that was the one who had called him to this in the first place. Another great lesson for us to kind of put that one in the back of your mind. As we walk through this, I've got a good friend of mine up in Canada. Uh, we have, uh, I have a prayer meeting that I, I run about once a week and uh, numerous times she's on that prayer meeting almost every time. And uh, somewhere in the midst, there, there's certain things that people say in prayer that I just love. And, and one of the things that she says is, we need to make him look good. And that's what Moses was trying to do. He wanted to make the Almighty look good. Is that the desire? Is that our desire? Let's make him look good through all of this. Now, we go on, and uh, my favorite plague, okay, I've talked about this one numerous times, but my favorite plague is the darkness one. I don't know why, I just, well, yeah, I do, because it's just intriguing to me. But here we have the land of Egypt, and then you have Goshen up there, you know, toward, toward Canaan, up there in the north area. And so there's, there's this divide between the Hebrews and the Egyptians. And darkness comes over the whole land. I think this is just wonderful staging. Darkness comes over the whole land. But as I said last week, there is a point in the plagues that the plagues no longer affect the Hebrews. Now, I don't know where that's going to be as this thing kind of plays out, but that's the day that I'm looking for right there, where it begins to happen to the religious system, the world system, the political system, and all of a sudden there's this set-apart group of people that it's not affecting. I, I got to see that day. Well, for this one, the staging is amazing that here we have total darkness in Egypt. But have you ever been out, I, I have, you know, way out in the woods somewhere, out in the desert, and you're away from, you know, you're, you're way out away from cities. I've been up in Alaska, uh, you know, they dropped me out of the back of a CH-47 out in the middle of nowhere. And um, they, I mean, there, there was nothing. There was nothing. It's total darkness. But even if you're out like that in the distance, if there's a town somewhere, you can see a, just a, a slight glow. It's, it's not enough to, if it's totally dark here where you're at, it's not enough to guide you. You can't really see anything, but there's just that tiny, tiny glow out the, on the horizon. And there's something about light that is, is made into us. That in the midst of darkness, if you go into uh, you know a dark cave, if you've ever been in one of those those play, you know those things you go through the caves, um, they, they'll turn the lights off, and I mean, you can't literally the 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 analogy you can't see your hand in front of your face. You can't. It's hard to even perceive that it's there. It's so dark. And then someone will turn on, a, they'll, they'll light a match or, or have a, a tiny, tiny flashlight over in the distance over there. And it is an involuntary reaction that you look at the light. It is 
literally impossible for you not to look at the light. Well, if that's true in the natural, then is it not true in the spiritual? That the darker the days become, that even if you have a little light, even if you don't, you know, even if you're not the the brightest candle on the menorah right now, <laughs> you might become brighter and brighter as those days go because we will probably learn to connect more with the oil of the anointing. So we might begin this whole thing as kind of, you know, little dim lights, but along the way, we begin to trim the wick better. We begin to, uh, to connect with the oil better. And so it may not just be about the world going in a direction. It may be about us going in a direction. I, I, I have to you know, think about this, that when they were in Goshen, before Moshe came back in, how much light were they shining there in Goshen? Really, very little to none. I mean, there was enough light in them because of the covenant. There was enough light in the Hebrews collectively that they could anger Pharaoh. But by the time they leave, their light's a little brighter, is it not? Maybe that'll say, that same thing will happen for us. Now, so the darkness um, is, is, to me, it's the place, I can't prove this out, but we see that when the Hebrews leave, there's a mixed multitude. The Egyptians, some of the Egyptians, you know, we're, we're told that, uh, that the, the Egyptians, now the people of, of uh, and this is over in chapter 11, now tell the people that every man is to ask his neighbor and every woman or neighbor for gold and silver jewelry. You know, they, they came out with incredible wealth out of Egypt. They, when this thing began, they're slaves. And all of a sudden they're walking out with, you know, gold and silver and tapestries and y you name it, they got it. We'll talk about that as we get into a little bit farther into Exodus. Is it possible that, and, and you know, what, it, it was literally kind of a, a voice inside that they were like, get these Hebrews out of here. I will give them whatever, you know, we'll pay them to leave now. But were there some of the, the Egyptians that began to think, that began to consider their own life in Egypt? began to think about what had happened, how they had mistreated the Hebrews to begin with. Maybe a couple of them got the books out, you know, when the lights came back on in Egypt. Should be a song about that or something. But maybe they got the books back out and started to look back and, oh, look at this guy, Joseph. And while well, he was one of the Hebrews and a change of heart, there wasn't going to be a change of heart from Pharaoh, but was there a change of heart from some of the Egyptians? And that began the process of this mixed multitude that is, you know, uh, you, then somebody shows up on your door and says, I, I don't know why I'm doing this, but, uh, you know, I had some silver coins that I had bought a, a few months ago and, you know, I just thought I'd give them to you as a gift. I, I know I, I've heard that you guys are leaving, and I'd like to give you a gift. Uh, but, but excuse me, could you, could you tell me more about this, this God that you serve? And as the conversation continues, by the end of it, it's like, is, is it possible? I, I don't know if there's a way for this, but I, I just need to ask you, is it possible for us to enter into covenant? with this God? Kind of like the foreigner who joins themselves to Hashem? Yeah, 
something similar to that. Uh, kind of like Ruth that joined herself. Numerous others we could go through. Okay. So we go on to chapter 11. Need to make a little bit of traction, a few tracks here. Go on to chapter 11, and what do we see? We see the, the instructions regarding the Passover. And I argue that this is not the giving of Passover, but the reinstitution of Passover. That the first Passover was in the garden. Passover had been um, observed by Cain and Abel, by Noah, by Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, by the boys in Egypt or in, uh, in, in Canaan. But somewhere along the way, they lost their identity of the Passover and when you do, you lose your identity of the covenant. And therefore, they became slaves. So this is not a giving of Passover, but a reinstitution of Passover, which is a reinstitution of their identity in the covenant. There's so much taught about Passover. I'm not really going to get into that right now. I'll teach more on that when we get to Passover in a couple of months. Chapter 12, uh, very, very important verses for, uh, for me. It's, uh, this show, you are to begin your calendar with this month. I was thinking the other night that we're coming up, Kathy and I are coming up on the anniversary of, uh, I think it will be March, February, actually, so next month. Uh, will be, I believe that's this February, 1998. This is, I mean, that's a lot of years ago, right? 23? Coming up on the 23rd anniversary of the first time that we as a family observed the time of the new moon. Back then, there was no, there, there was no disagreement regarding the new moon. Okay? There, I mean... Internet was not really a big thing in 1998. It was just getting going. But there was no discussion. I remember when I first started to teach uh, and learn about I, I'd, going to Israel. I'd find out some information because in, here in the United States, uh, you know, going to Messian, starting to go to Messianic congregation knew what? Uh, there, was, there was no concept of. There was no disagreement. I, I never had anyone that said, well, it's, you know, is it the conjunction or the sliver or, or the dark moon or this or that or the other thing? Or, well, do you really know what, what day it is? <laughs> Another song there. Uh, do you know what time it is? Do you know what calendar it is? Do you know what month it is? Uh, there was none of that. A very simple person in, in many ways. My wife might disagree with that at times, but Overall, I'm a very simple person. And so when I, I, I didn't even know that, that NASA said the new moon was the, the dark moon. It was like, I mean, I guess I didn't, I wasn't awake at that class and if I ever took that class in, in high school. But uh, I remember when I, I saw that, that NASA said the, the new moon was the dark moon, I went, that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, so we had, we had started on this little uh, excursion of celebrating the new moon, and it just didn't really excite me much to walk out with my wife and children and say, look, there's nothing there. It just didn't really do much, you know. I, I get more excited when I see the sliver than I do nothing. Now, when you want to observe, I'm not making fun. If you have a different day, People will ask me, well, is it the conjunction or the, 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 uh, the sliver? Or what? And I'll say, yes, maybe it's the season, and uh, maybe it gives us a little grace in this. But here's, here's the problem, that many people will argue about when the new moon is, but not observe or celebrate the time. Now, does, does that make any sense to you? It really doesn't to me. I mean, why argue about something you're not doing? 
that you're you're not that's not a part of your life. I was reading an article the other day uh, from a, a friend of mine in Israel, and he was quoting a rabbi from many centuries ago, and this this statement struck me that observing the time of the new moon is the same as entering into the divine uh, the divine presence that was there in Egypt. Huh. Think about that one. When we commemorate, observe, celebrate, whatever you want to however you want to term it, right? When we set this time aside, it is as if we are entering into the divine presence that was there with Moshe and the Hebrews in Egypt. Now, I read that statement after Kathy and I had done our new moon celebration the other night, so I'm kind of looking forward to the next one, just to, to think about that as we walk through it. So I'll give that one to you also to think about. How are we to observe the Passover? Uh, I'll, I'll do teaching on this, and I don't know what I'll do exactly. I know last year we did a cyber Passover. It was very well received, and there, there is a possibility that I'll do that one again. If I do, I'll, I'll use Barry Phillips' uh, Exodus uh, Passover of the Exile uh, is what I'll, I'll I, I, that's at least my plan right now. And we had, so, some of you saw there was some typos last year in it. Well, a good friend of mine, uh, without even asking permission, and then it just went ahead and edited the whole thing and made it absolutely perfect from cover to cover. At least that's what I'm told. And I know Brad well enough that it's probably pretty close to perfect. But uh, if, if that's what we do this year, I'll release that a week or so prior to, and we'll see. But get in your mind now. How are we to eat the Passover? Well, um, if you're a vegetarian, I'm sorry to tell you, but it's impossible for you to celebrate Passover without having lamb. It is a requirement. Now, I, I'm not going to get into the debate of you know, the slaughter of the lamb. Okay, if you're eating lamb, it's been slaughtered. So if you happen to have a lamb that you're raising on your farm and you slaughter that and you put it on your plate, it's no different then, you know, it's, it's no different than going to Trader Joe's and getting the organic lamb roast, which is really, really good, especially with my, my wife's mint sauce. But, um, and I don't really even like lamb to begin with. But if you're, you know, years ago, a number of years ago, maybe some of you were even there, we slaughtered a lamb on our property. We had about 100 people that got together for Passover. Well, talk about catching it from people that say, well, you were doing a sacrifice. No, we slaughtered a lamb that we had, that someone had given us. And, I mean, it, it still to this day, I uh, have people that talk about that one. And I look at it and say, you know, okay, so did you have lamb? Uh, yeah. Well, where'd it come from? Well, we got ours at Trader Joe's. Uh, do you think it just got there? I mean, somebody had to kill it along the way, you know? So it's, it's, a, it's a ridiculous argument, by the way. One that kind of goes toward that, uh, one of the signs behind me, like the one that's like over that shoulder. Yeah, let's see if you can see the whole thing. Um, quit, don't argue about things that are really, we shouldn't be arguing about, you know? Well, we're to eat, we're to have lamb. We're to have matzah, and we're to have bitter herbs. Those are the three things that are requirements for Passover. But the other part is just as much a requirement. You are to have your belt fastened. That means don't come to Passover like you go to Walmart and your jammies. 
Just say it. Now, I, I know that they were wearing robes, and to fasten your belt around your robe was to say, I'm prepared to go somewhere. It was a part of the, the, the dress. It's like, um, you know, I, well, I don't know, whatever, putting on your shoes, okay? Uh, it, it, you, it's something you did. Maybe tuck your shirt tail in. Nobody does that anymore either, okay? It's hard to get some references here. But it was about, it was about preparation. Shoes on your feet. Okay, sandals. In that day, um, probably as, as some of us, I mean, I, I don't wear shoes around the house. I don't like wearing shoes around the house. But if I'm going out in the yard, we got a rock driveway and um, kind of tenderfoot, you know. Uh, so I put some shoes on to go out in the driveway. If I was going to go out and walk the dog, I'm going to put some shoes on. If I was going to go out on a five-mile hike, put some shoes on. So, it says, your belt fastened, shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. What is that a picture of? It's a person that's going somewhere. When you take a trip, what do you do? You go and get the suitcase out of the closet. Now, we have a, our dog, Kaya, is kind of the same as our dog, Haley, was. Gets really nervous. Especially when Kathy gets her suitcase out. She doesn't really care that much when I get a suitcase out because she knows now that she gets to lay on my side of the bed at night. Huh. But, yeah. If Kathy gets her suitcase out, the dog gets really nervous because mom's going somewhere. You know, I don't remember the last time I got a suitcase out just to practice packing. And not go somewhere? I mean, isn't that kind of dumb? So you do things, you do things because you're going to do something. You get prepared to go somewhere because you have plans to go somewhere. You normally don't, unless you're just really strange, you probably don't just practice packing well, if you're, it's your first trip to Israel, I know uh, some people, Renee, that have like, you know, they started packing, practice packing like nine months prior to the trip. Uh, I've had numerous people who have told me, I packed my suitcase like 12 times. Uh, yeah, well, okay, maybe, maybe there are exceptions to this rule here. And you're to eat the Passover, <laughs> moving on, you're to eat the Passover in a hurry. Have you ever been to a Passover that lasted like three hours, four hours, half the night? Uh, I have. It's like, get me out of here. I, I don't know how these people do these, you know, seven course meal kind of things. I'm like, get me in the restaurant, get me some food, let me eat it. Okay, time to get out of here. I'm, I'm just not, you know, let's sit and enjoy. No, let's just get out of the place. Uh, the, these Passovers that go on forever and ever and ever. I mean, the sun's coming up and you're still, oh, uh, no. And, and don't do it reclining. You can't have your belt fastened, shoes on your feet, staff in your hand, eating in a hurry when you're reclining on your couch. So what's going on here? What has happened in Passover seders? Modern Passover seders are not about those who are in exile, but those who are, who are in captivity. Because if you're reclining in exile, you're now a captive. Once again, if you're reclining in exile, you're now a captive. A person who is going somewhere doesn't recline on Passover. They get ready and they eat it in a hurry because they're excited about going somewhere. Every year, 
We go out and we open the door to see if Elijah has come. Was there an anticipation last year? I don't not, you know, do I believe there's going to be a guy standing there, you know, kind of like Santa who comes down all the chimneys at the same time in one night? I, I, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. But is there, how many of you were kind of expecting some type of a Elijah moment? Elijah anointing at Passover last year. Is that excitement building for this year? We'll find out. If you come to Passover with shoes on your feet, your belt fastened, staff in your hand, and eat it in haste. I mean, I said this last year. I think it's worth repeating what if what if you had opened the door and there was a guy standing there you know long beard in a robe and said okay this is the time of the greater exodus everybody follow me except wait a minute stop only those of you who have your belt fastened Shoes on your feet, staff in your hand, and have eaten that meal in haste. Only you come with me. The rest of you will be left behind. Just something to think about. Chapter, okay, verse 42 of, uh, where am I at? Chapter, yeah, chapter 12, verse 42. David Stern translates it. Uh, this night continues to be a night when Adonai keeps vigil for all the people of Israel throughout all their generations. Now, I know that, the, that he who keeps Israel neither slumbers or sleeps. Okay, I got that. Uh, he, he never takes a break. He never rests. But this, it says that this is a night that he keeps vigil or he keeps watch. What does that mean? I know that there are some that have uh, come up with a, uh, this is just fine if someone wants to do this, I I don't have to agree with it. You know, no one needs to ask my permission about something. But there's people that stay up all night on Passover because of this verse. I'm I'm not into staying up all night for anything really, unless I have to. But um, this is a night that I think it's, it's like a, here, here's just my interpretation, okay, which is kind of what I do all the time. Is this is a special night? It was a special night, and it's a night of remembrance. And so, this was a night of his children being redeemed, of coming back together, of a special night of renewal of their their identity. And so it's a night that he watched over with great pride then and maybe every year since and into today. It's a night of special remembrance for the Almighty. Kind of the same, okay, this is, this is on a, a really low level, but you know, if you have, you have children, do you remember their birthday? But especially, I think, probably for a mom, and I, maybe ladies, you could correct me on this or not, but do you, on the birthday, remember the birth? Is it something that you maybe go back over in your mind during that birthday of, of that amazing event that brought that new life into this world? And so... Maybe for for women, I'm I just I've never even asked my wife about this, but you know maybe maybe it is I don't I don't maybe I'm totally crazy on this one, but I think it sounds plausible to me. There'd be a time that you remember. It's not just about honoring the person by sending them a gift, but it's a time that you reflect on the event that happened 
that made this event of honoring them, um, it, it made it possible. So is it kind of like that? I don't know. I don't know. Lastly, oh, a couple a couple things. Running out of time here. In uh, verse 51, the, on that very day, Yahweh brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their divisions. The word here is sabah, and uh, please uh, don't, don't ding me for my bad Hebrew, but sabah. And there's an interesting part of this verse, uh, this word is, goes all the way back to bow. The word bow is, as I said, is a bait, vav, and a, an aleph. The word sabah is a zayin, bait, aleph. So is the end of the chapter, the events of they left in their divisions or as, as, a, as an army? They left in order. They, they left in an orderly fashion as a, 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 as a battalion of, of army would leave. Okay? It wasn't just haphazard. So because Moshe went in, they were able to go out. Because Moshe came into Pharaoh, they were to leave, they were able to leave from Pharaoh. But the, the, the tying into this word is that it's Zadi is about the Zadik, the righteous. The bait is the house, and the Aleph is the ox or the strength. So those that were being connected to the house became entered into the strength of the house which in turn gave them the designation of the righteous of the house I'll let you play with that one on your own a little bit lastly chapter 13 uh, in verse 16 where am I at here there it is this will serve this is the last verse of this Torah portion this will serve as a sign on your hand into the front of your headband around your forehead with a strong hand. Yudhevavhe brought us out of Egypt. Um, this will tie in, of course, to Sinai of the hand and the, the forehead, the what is now the, um, the tefillim. But is it just about that physical? Or is it about that everything that's happened in Egypt which is a prophetic sign of everything that has happened to us in Messiah. Okay, let me make sure that I get that one in. That everything that happened in Egypt was a shadow and type of what would happen in Messiah to bring us into covenant. And that whole story, that whole account, would be something that we would, as it were, wear it on our hand and upon our forehead. That it would be the covenant that causes us to put our hand to something. It would be the covenant would direct our sight. So the covenant would direct our doing and our seeing. That's a good word for us in this day. May the covenant direct our doing and our seeing, which is about where we're going. Shavuot Tov. Have a blessed, prosperous week. Bezrat Hashem. God willing. See you again next week. <laughs> Who knows what it'll look like. Well, until then, we know because of the covenant, we can be strong. Ve'yichunecha Yisa Adonai Panav Elecha Ve'yasem Lecha Shalom